You see the podium? Go down, you see the podium? It says live. There's a podium, look, you don't see it? It's live right now. No, 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 no. Keep scrolling down. It says live, it says live. What about me now? Keep going down. Check, check. You see me? Go back up, go back up. Go back to the top. Punch in, punch in. JC's, capital J, go on the, capital J. In the search button. I'm trying to get your grandfather on. Yeah, is it call you? Hi, Stevie. Oh, it's already done. It's actually already started. Jerry already right. turned it off. Hey. It's Stevie. Okay. All right. <laughs> Hold on. It's on live on JC servers on Twitter. Well, get up there and see. I might got these people on board. Go over there. Sorry, Bobby. Yeah, tell me where you're at. It's on because I'm seeing a lot of names of people who are already on looking at it. Do you want me to call Jerry? Because he's standing right next to me. All right, baby. Love you. serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. We are going to start with a reading, More About Alcoholism, by Chris. Yeah. My name is Chris, and I'm an alcoholic and an addict. Chris. Chris. <clears throat> More about alcoholism. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we are real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily or, or mentally different <laughs> from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove that we can drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, we can control and enjoy the drinking is the great obsession from every abnormal drink. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many of us put pursue this into the gates of insanity. We learn that we had not fully conceived to our innermost selves that we are alcoholics. 
This is the first step in recovery, the delusion that we can drink like other people who, or presently maybe, has to be smashed. The alcoholics are men and women who have lost their ability to control our drinking. We have known, we, we, we know that no other real alcoholic ever reco recovers control. All of us felt at times that we were regaining control, but in such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control, which led to pitiful and comprehensible demoralization. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our types are in a grip of progressive illness. Over a considerable period, um, it only gets worse, never better. Since we are like men who lost our legs, they never grow new ones. Neither does it appear that any kind of treatment which will make alcoholics of our kind like other men. We have tried the uh, imaginable remedies. In some incident instances, there has been brief recovery, but always followed by still worse relapse. Physicians who are familiar with alcoholics agrees, alcoholism agree that there's no such thing like making an abnormal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish this. But it hasn't done so yet. yet. alcoholic and a believer. Pat. This is how it works from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, chapter 5. Really, have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path? Those who do not recover or people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to the simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates, but they are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They're naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. The chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. If you decided what you had what we have, and if you decide what we have, want what we have, and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. At some of these, we bought. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go, absolutely. Remember that we deal with alcohol cunning, baffling, and powerful. Without help, it is too much for us, but there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon, and here are the steps we took, which are suggested a program of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, we came to believe that power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, we humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. They made a list of all persons we had harmed, and we became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, we made direct amends to such people wherever, wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, we continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, we promptly admitted it. So through prayer and meditation, eleven, to improve our conscious contact with God, as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Many of us exclaim, what an order, I can't go through with it. But do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints 
the point is we're willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we set down are God's progress. So we claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic, could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And C, God could if he was alcoholic. transform him and watching him just surrender um, to that power and it's been such a blessing in my life to be able to witness that firsthand and um, to watch Noah go through his struggles and his doubts and to just see how God's light has overcome and overpowered all of that and brought him to where he is today so I'm excited to hear your story Noah come up and share <laughs> Hi guys, Noah, alcoholic. Noah. Can I move this? Yeah. I don't know how. Um, so, I always hunch back anyway, so I'll get used to this. <laughs> Bill Wilson. Oh, thank you. Oh, no. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bill Wilson, the founder of this wonderful program, the man that thought all this up about 80 years ago, yeah, about 80 years ago, um, said this about AA meetings. And man, I miss AA meetings. I miss sitting in a, a full room full of people. I'm still getting used to the online thing, and while I'm grateful for it, I miss the, uh, the lifeblood of a real meeting. But he said this about AA meetings. When he was asked for the purpose, in February of 1958, he said, the purpose of an AA meeting is sobriety, which he defined as freedom from alcohol through the teaching and practice of the 12 steps. That is the sole purpose of every alcoholic anonymous meeting. How do I, how do I adjust this? What do you want to do, buddy? Can I make it a little higher? A little higher? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We know how to do everything else. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Thank you, Jeff. Perfect. Thank you. I love you. Okay. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So grateful. So I'm going to talk about my experience, strength, and hope, which is what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now. And there's an important distinction there. In a lot of meetings you hear people say, I'm going to tell you what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And what that usually looks like is someone said, when I was drinking, every day was terrible. It was a living hell. And now that I'm sober, every day is Christmas and magical and full of life. And that's just not true for me. Um, my life before had ups and downs and it got really, really bad and I needed to change or I was going to literally die. But however, I still struggle. I struggle today, I struggled yesterday and I think it's important to talk about that we still struggle in sobriety, that it doesn't just become easy, uh, but it's worth it. As No matter the difficulty, sobriety is worth it. And that's my experience. Um, so on my past, this quote um, came up for me and it's one of my favorite quotes out of the big book. It's on page 124. It is, cling to the thought that, in God's hands, the dark past is the greatest possession you have, the key to life and happiness for others. With it, you can avert death and misery for them. And what that says is that I can tell you my story, all the things I've been through, all the pain, all the darkness, all the self-loathing, all the isolation, all of the self-pity, the pride, the ego, and you can relate to some of it. You can hear, hey, that's me. I can hear in your, in your speech, in your... In your testimony, I can see myself. And when we start to look for similarities and not differences, we can relate to one another. And that's one of the most important things. 
is a lot of people, myself included, come to an AA meeting and we start seeing, hey, this person's different, this person was homeless for 25 years, or this person only drank for a year and now they're in treatment, and, and we're just looking at the common denominator, which is alcoholism. And alcoholism, to define as important, is it's not necessarily about alcohol. The problem is this giant hole inside of me. The problem is my ego, it's Noah. And when I try to fill that hole with alcohol, it just gets bigger. When I try to pick up a drink to kill the pain, to change how I feel, the hole just gets bigger. So we're looking for a substitute, and that substitute will hopefully be revealed in this meeting. So what I was like when I was still drinking, when I was still doing the things I did, ripping and running, I was very uncomfortable in my own skin. That was one of the big things, is that ever since I was a child, I can never feel truly comfortable in a room of people or by myself. I always wanted to change how I felt. There were very few times that I remember actually genuinely feeling a, a true peace because I was disconnected from my creator, I was disconnected from friends and family, and my response to that was to retreat further because I felt threatened, I felt so much fear, and I was overwhelmed by fear. Every second I was worried about what everyone thought of me. I was so concerned with what people would say about me that I wouldn't say anything. So from a young age I was very, very shy, very, I was like this tall, fat nerd chilling in the corner, and no one ever talked to me because I was so difficult to talk to. But that was, I was just overwhelmed by fear. That's what ruled my life. That was the word that summed Noah up in the past. And that fear led, led me to drink at a very early age. And once I started drinking at about like 12 or 13, and I take that first sip, which was a really big sip, um, I felt like the most comfort and peace. You know that ease and comfort of the first drink? My first drink, I felt a lot of ease and comfort. And right from that, that, that first sip, the second alcohol hit my bloodstream, I was like, I'm gonna drink and use until the day I die. I will be intoxicated for the rest of my life because this feeling is the first time I could ever feel comfortable in my own skin. This is the first time I can truly be myself. This is the first time I can talk to people and I just resigned to that. I, I resigned that I will be under the influence for the rest of my life. My grandfather says this thing that really caught my eye and it's a good teaching. It's that when I first started drinking, it was all fun. And then it became fun with some problems. And when I hit the bottom, it was nothing but problems. And that progression happened very quickly for me. It was a very, very rapid progression because I had no brakes on this bicycle. I was just going. I was just going and there was no signs of stopping. You know, any substance there was, any form of alcohol, I would try it instantly. Great, give me another one. And I was just running it because I was so afraid of myself and reality that I had to escape it in some way. I was excessive in everything I did, everything I did. Um, I would just shack up in my room for days and isolate, and I was addicted to other forms of, uh, of escape, such as sex addiction, and I took that to, to the logical extreme, and I would just play video games and watch movies to escape life. I was running from myself as fast as I could. But that had to crash eventually, and it did, and I knew I needed help, so I sought out treatment. This is my first attempt at sobriety. I, I got about five months, but it was full of half measures. And when we talk about insanity, this is me in treatment. I was, I was two months sober, snorting my psych meds, and they told me I needed a higher power, so I researched like ancient Egyptian mythology. I found a bird god, so I'm like snorting my psych meds, praying to a bird god from 6,000 years ago in ancient Egypt. And, um, and I'm, I'm working the steps with my sponsor right after. And it's just like so much insanity. Um, when I talk about how crazy I got, I, I decided that I needed to change my identity and I told everyone my name was Mason. There's this girl that I lived with and her entire family doesn't even know my real name. That's what I'm like when I'm in alcoholic mode. And you, I, I can be dry and be sober and still be worse off than I am than I'm drinking. Because when I take away the drink, I, I'm taking away a solution. That, a, a poor solution, not a good solution, but when I take away the alcohol and I'm still running the isms, when I still have the ego, when I still have the selfishness, I am, I am a terrible person to be around. I am manipulative. I, am, I can go on and on. I can go on and on with this dark past, but let me just get to the end. At my bottom, um, February, Valentine's Day, I think February 14th of 2018, I got kicked out of my girl's house because I was so drunk and I slept by a train tracks and I spent about like eight hours debating if I should commit suicide. 
Um, I never thought I would make it past 22 years old. I never hoped to, I just kind of resigned to that. I'd die by 22, it was a good run. Um, and I just remember the feeling of laying right by the train as it passed by and the gravel from the wheels of the train flowing into my face and I could see hell itself. And um, that was the night that I called my mom and I was like, I really need help. I reached out to someone, I said, I can't do this anymore. I, I'm going to die, I'm going to die tonight. So they, they decided to get me help, and by the time they were there to pick me up, I thought I wasn't done, and I went on the worst two weeks run of my life, and I was homeless, I was in abusive situations that were bringing up past traumas, I was running with people I never should have, I am not a hard person, I am not street mentality, I am a, a pretty, pretty calm guy, and doing the things I did, uh, I had no idea. I was using and drinking in ways I never thought I would, and it was hell. It was literal hell. And that was my bottom, and I can never forget that. I was so desperate to escape that lifestyle. I would do anything, anything in the world. You know, you tell me, stand on one foot like this for 12 hours, and that's how you get sober. I'm, I'm doing it, I, I'm doing it. Anything that is suggested to me. And I was just so desperate. So when I come into treatment, I know I can't do this. My step one is complete. My life is powerless, and completely, I'm powerless, and my life is unmanageable. I have no control. Uh, I cannot manage anything. Uh, I can't go into work, you know, I'm not showing up right. All of my relationships are failing, they're miserable. My, my sexual relationships, failing. My relationships with the family, failing. And I am a mess, I'm a train wreck. I am literally a train wreck. And I died that day, a big part of me died that day, but thank God I was reborn. And uh, that night, um, my sobriety date, which is March 15, 2018, I attended a church and I, the, the moment that happened is, is I was with a bunch of people that still burping up alcohol like three days sober and they're all singing, they're all singing these hymns and they're all praising God and I had, I was like a devout atheist, like I hated God if he existed, I didn't want to know about him, I didn't want to talk to him because how dare he put me on this earth with this much suffering, how dare he, I was such a victim, I was such a victim and that's all I was and that's all I wanted to be, it's all I allowed myself to be. So I was angry at him, but seeing all these people, you know, just fresh out of the same place I was, with so much hope and their smiles, and I wanted that, so I ran up and I knelt at the altar, and I've been with God ever since. That's that. That is what happened. That is what happened to me. And ever since then, I've been doing the work. You know, that month I I ran through the steps, got them done in two weeks. I met every day with my sponsor for hours on end, and. Um, that was the way that the steps worked for me is in, in old school AA they did the steps in a weekend and I think the faster you do them the better at least for me um, because I couldn't drag them out I needed the miracle like now and it is a miracle you just got to do the work it takes effort he lays the path and I walk it and what I'm like now in sobriety is the exact opposite of everything I once was I'm a good employee when I would call out every three days before um, when I used to be a sex addict, I waited till marriage to honor God, which is very important for me in my relationship with, the, with my higher power. I'm a good steward of money, whereas I was always asking everyone for a couple bucks just to get by. Now I can actually hold on to a couple checks now, which is something I'm just now experiencing. And just now, it, the miracles keep on coming. There truly are daily miracles. The promises are not extravagant. In two years, I've married my best friend. I have a group of about 10 guys I can call at any second, and they'll pick up the phone. Um, I've had the best memories of my entire life. Things that, you know, I'm astounded that could happen to anyone I know, and it's me. And the joy that I have in this brotherhood and fellowship in this community is just, it's just breathtaking. And I don't deserve a drop of it, but I get it anyways. And that's a mind-blowing, uh, realization. Now all these gifts that God gives me, all of the, the promises, I can't do the program for the promises, and that's an important thing to realize, is I have to do this out of an honest, loving standpoint of I want to be of use to fellow man and to God himself. I want to be of service. I want to help. I want, there's this, there's this movie, it's called Train Spotting, and at the end, the, the guy who's a heroin addict, he's walking, and I'll always remember this quote. He says, I want it, I want the picket fence, I want the family, I want a microwave in my kitchen, I want a day job, I just want a normal life. Things that are so difficult for me as an alcoholic, I wanted all of that, and I got it, and I just keep getting more. 
I'm truly happy, joyous, and free from my alcoholism. And the word free, I misunderstood for all of my life. The word free, I thought, you know, hey, I'm free. I, I got a beer. I'm talking to this girl right now. There's a campfire, and we're having a great time. I'm free. I'm not bound by any social conviction. I can do whatever I want. I'm a rebel. This is the life. But I was trapped. I was ensnared by feelings. I was caught up in ego and bondage and addiction and alcoholism. It was so overwhelming, but I didn't realize it. I was building a cage around myself, thinking that it's freeing me. And I, I just didn't see it. I was blind. I had to get out of myself and I had to, have, I had to ask others for support because I, whatever I see is not true. That's why I need everyone around me. That's why I need to run everything by everyone. That's why I need accountability. So when we come to read this big book, and this big book and sponsorship is what I credit my sobriety to. Meetings are incredible and I need them, but the real miracle is in sponsoring people, being sponsored, reading this book. This is an incredible book. And the, the miracles continue after this. You know, AA, AA is a spiritual kindergarten. That's what the creator said about it. This is the beginning. There's so much. This is milk. The meat comes later. And the most important part of the big book, and I needed this, and we all need this if we are to succeed, is what Dr. Silkworth calls the psychic change and what Carl Jung and many others in the beginning of Foundations of AA call the spiritual awakening and the spiritual experience. And what that is, is a huge emotional displacement and rearrangement. Ideas, emotions, and attitude, which were once the guiding forces of our lives, are suddenly cast to the side, and a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. And what that saying is, is I completely change. The old me dies, and there's a new me now. Everything I once valued, uh, money, relationships, power, a good job, that all falls, and, and I just want to help. I just want to be of service to others. I just want to love. I just want to support. I just want to be happy, joyous, and free. That's, that's what I want, and that becomes important. And the most important thing becomes God. And once that is the driving force behind all my actions, I'm truly plugged in. Our previous belief system when we're in active addiction and alcoholism is of fear, hate, and it's all an illusion. We lie to ourselves, we manipulate, we rationalize, the list goes on and on. The key to life, in my understanding, and what's changed my life, is what Jesus said. Love your neighbor as yourself. Which we hear all the time, it becomes kind of rote, so let's break that down. Love your neighbor, be loving to all, but first, in order to love your neighbor, you need to love yourself. I need to love myself. For the longest time, I couldn't love myself. I hated myself. I couldn't stand waking up and being me. I would have given anything to be, to be that guy or to be anyone else, anyone on TV. And I was such a good victim. I could play that card forever because of my abusive past and traumas, bullying, um, sex abuse. You know, I, I had so many reasons that I could pull out a card and say, this is why I'm a victim. This is why I'm entitled to this self-pity. And there's a, re there's a point where I realized like, the pain had to happen. The pain is, is stone, it's set. But I don't have to continue to suffer. I don't have to live in that pain. I can get out of it. But I can't do that on my own power. So I need a higher power, which is God, and he can. So, you know, step one is, and I, I knew this, I can't. Step two is I have to believe that God can. And then step three is I'll let him. And that, that is the, the most powerful experience, just transferring everything up here and giving it away. It's really hard because all of that I identified as me. You know, all of this insanity, nonsense, misery I thought is of value to me for some sick reason. But, and I didn't even realize it, it was all unconscious. But I had to give it all up to God. When we live in this previous belief system of fear, hate, and illusion, we just fester this ego, this self, and we're threatened by everyone around us. We think of everything as a threat to our instincts. You know, someone compliments me and I'm so worried about what he said. Someone's like, nice shoes. And I'm like, I just got them. Do you, do you think they're nice? And then I walk away. I'm like, what did he mean by nice shoes? And I'm just constantly in fear. I think everyone's coming at me. It's insanity. And when we talk about sanity, I like the big book definition of sanity, which is not 
um, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That was what insanity looks like when it's played out, but insanity is the lack of proportion of the ability to think straight, which is, I can function well. A lot of people as alcoholics can function well. They can have a great job, have a family, but when it comes to alcohol, they're insane. They have no proper way of understanding that if they drink, they will drink six more, and then they will be up at five in the morning going to a casino, and they, they can't think that through because this one proportion, this one piece of the brain just isn't wired right. And they can function perfectly well in day-to-day -day scenarios, but when it comes to alcohol, they're insane. And that's me. I'm insane in a lot more ways, but I love this big book, uh, Sanity. I think that's on page 62. Um, so when I come to read more about this and I get a sponsor, he tells me I have this three-layer cake of disease, and that is the mental obsession, which is when I'm not drinking, I really want to get drunk. I'm not comfortable, I need to get drunk. I want that ease and comfort of the first drink, I need to drink, pass me a drink. And then once I take in that drink, I'm craving another drink. I want another drink and I need it, and the craving never stops to cease. The craving, once kicked in, is never ending, it's infinite. That's that hole, it keeps getting bigger. Every drink I pour in there, the hole gets bigger. And why is that? It comes down to why I'm an alcoholic. I have an allergy. I have a physical allergy, and that means that alcohol affects me differently than anyone else. It affects me completely differently. Uh, the same way a bee sting might just hurt to some people, but it's life-threatening for others. Alcohol, for me, is life-threatening. On page 85, it begins to touch on the spiritual malady, um, which is what leads me to obsession. This is a very important piece because without spiritual discipline, without a rigorous spiritual life, I will revert to obsession, which will bring me to the drink. So I have to catch this in my daily spiritual maintenance. And the quote here is that, it is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe, cunning, baffling, powerful. We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the spiritual maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day where we must carry out the vision of God's will into all of our activities. And that's a really high call. Every day I have to carry God's will into everything I do. And that sounds a lot harder than it is. But once I start working with God, the creator of the universe, it's so easy. Once I'm plugged in with my creator and we're walking hand in hand, it feels like the most miraculous thing ever. Thing ever. I feel like I'm walking on water. It's like every second is a miracle. But I first have to be willing. I have to be willing to jump into that because it's a, it's a big commandment. I have to give up myself, my, my ego, who I think I am, and I have to give it to God and say, who, who do you say I am? Who am I really? What can I do? So in order to not drink, I have to enlarge my spiritual life. What that means is doing service work, so sponsoring, meeting with a sponsor, helping others, no matter who it is, going to church, uh, the fellowship of the program, late nights, talking to others, drinking coffee, and just talking about our experiences, and just the camaraderie. I have so many miraculous memories, just so many wonderful nights sitting around with people talking about life. It is the greatest high. It is, the spiritual high is the most incredible I've ever felt. You know, I used to do all sorts of things, seeking some kind of spiritual experience, seeking, I want the meaning of life, so I'm gonna do this. And I never got it. No substance could ever tell me what life was about. But God did as soon as I stopped putting the substances in. There's two powers we do have. If we're powerless over alcohol, we do have two powers. One is the power to make it to a meeting. The power to pick up my phone and call someone before I want to drink. That is the most important thing is that substitute. Is My brain tells me to drink. I can listen to it or I can subvert it and call someone. And that has been the most helpful thing the most valuable tool to me because God speaks in right angles. He speaks to you, to me. And because uh, oftentimes I can't hear God's voice directly. So I need to, to seek out that support and fellowship from others. Because other people can see the problem much better than I can because I'm blind to it. The other power we have is to pray, is to seek God, is to read texts and to, to dive in. And that spiritual power will drive us very far. 
um, the fellowship talking to someone else will, will prevent me from drinking tonight, will, will show me more about how God works, how this program works every time. But a relationship with the creator of everything around me, of everything in this room, of this microphone, this book, my hands, that creator walking hand in hand with him will change my life beyond measure. Once I'm in tune with the universe itself, I, I'm, I'm set as long as I stay on that line and I don't divert from that narrow road. So when we talk about God, there's this metaphor I really like. Um, think about a palm tree. We're in sunny South Florida, so let's think about a palm tree. Does it obsess over anything? Does it have any stress? Does it overthink? Does it wonder how others think it is? Does it wonder uh, what that bee is thinking about its coconuts? No, absolutely not. Still, it does God's will perfectly. It grows. It takes in nutrients. It grows fruit. This tree does God's will perfectly. And us being higher life, do you not think that God would give us the same set of DNA? The same harmony with all creation. God has a plan for us, but we just are blind to it. We turn away from it. Every human being has this, this pull towards God. We, we just reject it. We suppress it because of what the world says. And the, what the world says around us is completely opposite to what this book says. The world is fueled by ego. It's fueled by, uh, by money, by drinking, by status, by power, all of these lustful things. And this book says the exact opposite of all that. It says, be humble, help others. Uh, don't hoard resources. Go help somebody. And uh, it's about self selflessness. And when the world promotes selfishness at an ever-increasing rate, it's alarming and it's shocking. And we see it everywhere. You flip on the news. You flip on any channel and it's dominated by ego. At this point, I'm going to read uh, We Agnostics. This is my favorite part of We Agnostics. And it touches on what I was just talking about. says, yet we have, we had been seeing another kind of flight, a spiritual liberation from this world, people who rose above their problems. They said, God made these things possible, and we only smiled. We had seen spiritual release, but like to tell ourselves it wasn't true. Actually, we were fooling ourselves, for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or other, it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are as facts as just as old as man himself. We finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our genetic makeup, just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. He was as much as a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. It is so with us. And that realization is, is very deep. It's very mind-blowing, is that God is not so far away. God is in me, he's in you, he's in all around us. And once I start looking for God in me, in you, and all around me, I'm truly breaking through this cycle, the cycle of, uh, of drink because I can't I hate myself, and I hate myself because I drink, and I'm in fear, and I, I break out of that cycle by, by channeling that God consciousness the big book talks about. And before I close, I want to talk about what keeps me sober. The, the most practical application I have of the steps is in the 12 and 12, it talks about the spiritual axiom in step 10. And I know that's kind of a jump from steps 1, 2, and 3, but I need this every day to stay sober. Step 10 spiritual axiom says that every time we are disturbed, no matter what the cause, there's something wrong with us. So someone can walk up to me and punch me in the face. And if I'm upset, there's something wrong with me. Which is a very grave realization. It's difficult to understand that. Like, how am I wrong? I'm the victim here. But I have to realize, I'm upset because I'm upsettable. Whatever anyone does to me, I can react in kindness or love and tolerance. I'm, I have to r rationalize this as I'm choosing to be upset. I'm letting this person rob me of my joy. And that's difficult, and that's a difficult example, but it looks like other things, like people saying little mean things about us behind our back. I can choose to be angry with that person and retaliate, stepping on their toes, which promotes disconnection, uh, death, and disharmony. Or I can talk to them and apologize for anything I may have done, making a, an immediate amends, uh, even if I didn't do anything, just to talk to them. And I can feel better about it. 
I can be loving, and I can choose God, unity, and harmony. And it's, we're either going in one or two directions here in everything we do. You know, sobriety and recovery is like a staircase that goes up and down. It doesn't go sideways. We are never at any point not moving. We're either moving more in the direction of God or more in the direction of death. It's, it's plain and simple. Every step changes something. Every step is either towards God or away from God. Now, when I am disturbed, and I choose to be disturbed, and I have to believe I choose it because I, I can't be a victim, I'm responsible for my feelings, I can obsess over the ease and comfort of the first drink. So that, in my understanding, is how I relapsed twice for five months, is, is I was disturbed, so I began obsessing. I'm upset, so I go, I know what would make me feel better, a drink. So I think about the drink, I get the drink, now I'm craving more, and I drink more, and an allergy is triggered, and I'm drunk, and I'm homeless yet again, and I have nowhere to go, and I'm freaking out. But there is such a solution, and it is this fellowship, it is this family, and I'm so grateful for my sponsor and my sponsees and all that have been a part of this journey. And you know, in the past weekend, we I've known five or six people pass away. Uh, one of them was my roommate for a long time. And, and a halfway, and um, this disease is real. This disease will kill. Um, people listening to this, you will know someone who dies soon. It's tragic. Uh, we lucky few are the ones who make it. But that happens because of the work we do. It happens because we dive in, because we put effort into this, because we care about it. It's like when we plant a flower, if we don't water it, if we don't feed it, it's gonna die. Our recovery when we plant it, do we just put it there and walk away? No, we don't. And what that looks like is in my first 90 days, do I decide to skip a meeting? That's dangerous. That's dangerous in my first 90 days. Um, when someone picks up the phone asking for help or calls us, do we pick up the phone answering and they're asking for help and we don't pick up the phone? That's dangerous. It's these little things. It's a slow fade always. It's a few steps down before we start tumbling. And I have to be ever vigilant on my sobriety and I have to be reaching out to others. Um, I've had so many times where I, I have a crazy idea. Um, I remember once I told my roommate, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to start smoking weed now. This is like a year and a half sober. And I'm like, I'm going to start smoking weed now. And he's like, uh, he's like, where are you going to live? You live in a halfway. And I'm like, uh, I figure I can rent a motel for half the week and just kind of rough it the other three days. And he's like, so you're going to go homeless. You know we're going to go homeless. And anyone who knows me knows I am not cut out for the streets. And I was like, yeah, I, th I think I could do that. And he just showed me my own insanity by holding up a mirror to me. And sometimes that can be harsh, but my understanding of love has evolved. Sometimes love is not telling people the easy, soft, sugar-coated thing. Sometimes love is telling people things they don't want to hear, and that's difficult. That's hard, because I feel threatened. Everything I am feels threatened when someone tells me harsh things. But it's in love because they're encouraging growth. You know, when, when a tree is growing, you have to prune off some of the branches that are dying. Um, so I would like to close this with um, one of my favorite parts of the big book. And if, if you hear anything, listen to this. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer, that's God. Being all powerful, he provided what we needed. If we kept close to him and performed his work well, Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. Thank you. Would anyone like to share? Okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Anthony. I'm a recovering addict. Um, if I can show up to any meeting here, you know, one person, it'll be Noah. Um, I consider him a very good friend, um, him and his wife. Um, one thing I've learned from him in this program is that 
you know, I am full of imperfections, but th that's how we get better is actually being able to in identify with them. You know, um, greatest thing in sobriety is the people God puts in my life because I can now trust them. The world, I cannot trust them uh, because, you know, and, you know, when it comes down to being an addict, we're very good at doing things. We look for validation, we search for love in all the wrong places, and being around the wrong people, we get and took advantage of. So, you know, and the sobriety is a fellowship. And, you know, when God put Noah in front of me, you know, they see, I seen one big thing and it was integrity. You know, integrity is doing the right thing when nobody else is watching. So I started looking at, you know, you know, he's Noah. He's not trying to be anyone else. And you know, my whole life I wanted to be what other people wanted me to be. And that that's what hurt. Because, you know, I wanted you to like me, but I didn't like myself. So, you know, being around him and his wife, they believed in me, they took me to the studio, they believed in what you know, what I wanted to do, but they told me I had to either choose my old life or my new one. But my old life would have to die and my new new one would have to, to be in the forefront. And being able to to actually see people do it, it gave me a blueprint. You know, um, if you're out there with time and you're, you don't have anything, reach out to people you know that need help. You know what I'm saying? Is stay home orders, that doesn't mean you stay off your phone. Call somebody, you know what I'm saying? Reach out to somebody. This program is all about fellowship, service, and, and being out of self. And in order to get this, you have to be fearless. You have to be willing to help somebody that really don't know how to get the help. You know what I'm saying? Stand up for what you believe in, and I can tell you one step at a time, one day at a time, you can get this. You know, um, there's no way possible I can say I'm, I'm ever going to recover. But with this family that I have now, I'm not alone. And that's that's the best army in the, in the business when you can trust who you're going to war with. And um, you, you, you actually got to be able to surrender. The day I surrendered, I was able to uh, tap into a source that unlocked a lot of things that I knew was there, but I couldn't access because God is not gonna allow you to use it, your your gifts against him. You know what I'm saying? He put you on this earth to be the great you, but only one that's gonna stop you is you. I, you know, my whole life I sat there and I blamed everyone instead of the man in the mirror. And you know, and being able to look myself in the mirror now and, and say that, yeah, I made a mistake, I need to go apologize to this person. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, maybe they might not take the apology, but guess what? I took that weight off my shoulders and I, I stepped in front of them showing that I'm not perfect. I do make mistakes. You know, there's a lot of us out there that's feeling like we're alone. You're not alone. Pick up the phone, call somebody. You do not have to pick up the drug because someone died and you lost your job. We all going through it right now. But believe me, you're not alone in this fight. And that's one thing I've learned about these two that they're, they put their pride and ego aside and they will help other people. And you know, if they can do it, I can do it. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, that's a great share. And Noah has definitely taught me about that. I'll see him come off of like 12 hours of work and someone will call him and be like, I need your help. And he leaves and does it. Like, it's just endless. No matter how he's feeling, he helps the next person. So that's really inspired me. Um, anyone else like to share? Pat? Hey, hi, I'm Pat. I'm a recovered alcoholic and addict. I'm trying to leave her. Pat. You know, you're always <clears throat> such a power example. Um, what I like about you is you have two, two qualities that I see in you. That, out, that are outstanding. <clears throat> One of them is the seriousness of your relationship with your higher power, God, Jesus. And the other part is your childlikeness, which we're told in the Bible, we are to be childlike, have faith like, like a child, be trusting, spontaneous, truthful in the moment. And both you and Miriam both have this quality. It's such a pleasure hearing somebody so young, so on fire, man. 
where some of us have not been spared 20, 30 years or more. And I'm just, I'm so grateful that you're part of my life. Thanks. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Anyone else like to share? Jerry, would you like to share? Okay, let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Ah. I was wondering when you were going to put the mic microphone down. You were like, my name is Jerry Pina. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Jerry. This is my home group. Welcome to the Golden Text Friday night group. Uh, I remember five and a half years ago, I was in uh, my apartment, and we figured out that we would name this group because of the uh, portion in the big book where, where Bill W. says, Henrietta, the Lord has been so wonderful to me, cured me of this terrible disease, and I just want to tell the whole world. And I like what, uh, and, and, and congratulations to Noah for an amazing message of hope. You know, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed the path. Those who do not recover, people who cannot or will not be completely honest with themselves. They are such unfortunate, they seem to have been born that way. They're naturally incapable of grasping the benefit in a manner of being which requires rigorous honesty. And Noah has been honest. And uh, it's been a pleasure to see Noah grow and continuously grow. And it's been a pleasure to see Miriam grow and continuously grow. But before they started to grow together, they first grew individually. Now they grow collectively. And that's the thing about this program. You know, we start first to grow individually before we can transmit something collectively. And it's a process. And what Anthony was talking about was just give back. You know, recovery, sobriety, like I was talking to a friend of mine today, is so much more than not picking up a drink or a drug. It's the way I speak. It's the way I behave. It's the way I show up. It's, a bit, it's, it's the way I think. You know, the Lord says, listen, I'm going to raise the bar. If you think it, it's wrong. So not to condemn yourself, but to check yourself before you what? Wreck yourself. You know, you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. You know, I was talking to somebody, and he's like from Dade County. I'm from Dade. I'm not from Broward. I'm sorry. I'm from Dade. And in Dade County, we have a saying, don't talk about it, be about it. And you know, right now, I gotta tell you, um, right now what I'm about is God's business. I'm about God's business. And you know how I'm about God's business? I'm taking care of my hula hoop. So by me taking care of my hula hoop, others whose hula hoops don't seem to be going in circles, keep falling in the floor, they're gonna see, man, I, I should keep going, keep moving forward. Listen, we're not minimizing what's happening out there. It's it's. Yo, it, it's not, it's sad that people are dying. It's sad that this is happening, you know, but we gotta move forward and pray for them and hope for the best. And be responsible. Be responsible by having the social distancy, being responsible by doing our part. And not throwing rocks. Not smoking rocks, but not throwing rocks. <laughs> don't smoke the rock, you know? But don't throw the rock. You know, don't throw the rock like when the woman was in the, it, it was, was going to be stoned, and, and, and the Lord said, he who is without, stone, without sin, throw the first rock. Don't, I try not to throw any rocks living in a glass house. So what do I mean by that? What everyone should be promoting is hope. We need to put our differences aside. And, pro and we do this anyways in the program. But now we got to do it with the world and with others who are not part of the program, who right now are panicking. Now, listen, listen, it's hard for a person like ourselves that goes to the hood at 3 in the morning walking to be scared. You know? It's like, whatever, let me get me. We're not scared, bro. Why do you think God chose us? Why do you think God says this? And I want the outcasts. I could have given this to the attorney. I could have given this to the doctor. God said, yo, I want you, Jerry. You want me? I haven't taken a shower in a week. Yeah, I want you. 
Can I get some good eating? I'll give you some. I want you. I want you, Noah. Noah, you're an atheist, especially you, Noah, because what you do when you're transformed is give God glory. You give God glory. You know, our disease kills, killed 69,000 people last year. Our disease killed, that's just 69,000 that we recorded. Okay? Like, you know, in the hood, and in the, there's a lot of people dying that are not recorded because of this addiction. So we know what it is to deal with something that's deadly. And the way we deal with it is by getting plugged in, by making these right now online meetings so that we can fellowship together, so that we can hear God. The meetings is not what's really the big deal. The meetings is a form of getting to communicate and hear the voice of God through the speaker, to those that share. Because if we forget what the meaning, listen, listen, I, I, I love going to the trap house. I love the dope guy, but I wasn't going there for the dope man. I was going there for what he had to offer. You understand what I'm saying? When I went to the bar, I wasn't going there for the bartender. I was going for what the bartender had to offer. So when I come to the meeting, listen, I'm coming here to buy with you, but I'm coming here to get what God's, what's being offered, which is God, which is a solution. So that when I end the meeting, I go back out in the world, and I am the meeting. You feel me? We just gather together here, but the meeting is out there. How we do, how we talk, how we behave, how we apply, it's out there. So this is just like, you know, roll call. <laughs> roll call, officer. Yes, sir. What are my mission, God? And this is what we do. And we come into these meetings and we anticipate a message of hope. Because this is what we do. This is what we do. You know, I'm grateful for God every day. I'm grateful that he set me free. Every day I'm grateful to God. Every day I think about what would it be, right? Listen, I was telling my wife last night, damn, baby. Can you imagine right now getting high and being out there in the alley? Not that she ever got high. But can you imagine right now getting high and being caught up with all this chaos? So what I got to say, what I'm going to end this meeting with is this. Don't sell your birthright. Don't sell your birthright. What does that mean, don't sell your birthright? Don't sell your sobriety for a lie. Don't think, don't think, trust me, don't think that one beer, one head, one leg, one trick, <laughs> yo, you're gonna get deceived, and you're gonna say, what, what happened? <laughs> what? And you're done. Don't call me, call Tyrone. Don't call me. <laughs> Because you're going to be done. Don't sell the gift of sobriety for anything. Listen, I'd rather act like a fool if you have to. We'll bring you back. We'll bring you back. Because you know why? We know what it is to be a fool. Because we know we're fools. The only difference between, us, between me and you being a fool is I know I'm a fool. So I ask God to help me not to be a fool. But whatever you do, don't pick up. Because it's not going to make things any better. It's going to make things worse. Amen. And it's going to take you away from the presence of your creator. And it's going to give you everything that you don't want. It's going to give you fear, anxiety, frustration, despair. It's going to give you that incomprehensible, demoralizing feeling that's going to tell you what's the use. Let me continue. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Noah, for an amazing message. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, God, that just for today, you set me and set us free. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, um, so we are going to do virtual chips. Um, first, I would like to announce the celebrants for this month. We have Tammy Jo with nine years. Woo! Marissa with three years. Namaste Mandy with two years. Congratulations, guys. 
Um, so for the chips, um, we're just going to have you raise your hand um, if you would like to pick up a virtual chip. And um, if you're online, just give us a shout out so we can acknowledge you. So first we're going to do white chips, which is the surrender chip. All right, we have Lauren. Terry. Steve. Steve. Anyone online? All right, congratulations, guys. Most important people in the room. Uh, we have a red chip for 30 days. Steve? All right, see you again. Uh, we have a blue chip for 90 days. Um, we have, oh, I forgot 60 days. 60 days, anyone have 60 days? All right, I don't know what color that is. Um, green for six months. All right, keep coming back. And nine months. Yeah. Yale. 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 Yale has nine months. And what's your name? I'm sorry. Mark. Mark. That's right. Mark is that. So congratulations, guys. Um, suggestions are um, do what those who came before you are doing. Get a sponsor. Read the book. Do the steps. Do the work. Um, so now we're going to close with the golden text statement, and I have my friend Sarah coming up to read that. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah, and I'm a recovering drug addict. Sarah. Bill was at my house talking to my wife and me. We were eating lunch and I was listening and trying to find out why they had this release that they seemed to have. Bill looked across my wife and said to her, Henrietta, the Lord has been so wonderful to me, curing me of this terrible disease that I just wanted to keep talking about it and telling people. I thought, I think I have the answer. Bill was very, very grateful that he had been released from this terrible thing and he had given God the credit for have done it. And he's so grateful about it, he wants to tell other people about it. That sentence, the Lord has been so wonderful to me, curing me of this terrible disease, that I just want to keep telling people about it, has been a sort of golden text for the AA program and for me. Ray Brayton also has nine months. Ray has nine months as well, so you can acknowledge him. Congratulations. Thank you, Sarah, for reading. Um, this has been an amazing meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, God. And we're going to close with um, our Father prayer. So if everyone could just stand in place and bow your heads, we're going to do a moment, moment of silence followed by our Father. Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Stay.